Once again, we greet you today in the name of Jesus Christ, our wonderful Lord and Savior. Good to see you here in the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church today. We welcome every one of you. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, most certainly appreciate you tuning in to Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. We're hoping the hour coming up. We can be an inspiration to everyone. Now take your Bible today and turn to 1 Samuel, uh, 2 Samuel, I'm sorry, 2 Samuel chapter 4 for verse of scripture. And then several verses in chapter 9 of 2 Samuel. Now, if you have the original Schofield Reference Bible, you find chapter 9 on page 364. But I want to read a verse found uh, in chapter 4 and verse 4. Now, while you're turning there, I want to say to you, especially in the radio listening audience, if you'd like to have this message and the music on cassette tape, you can get the cassette tape by writing in. And uh, it'll be tape number 270, tape number 270, and you can write in and get the cassette tape, and they're $3 each, and the gift is used to help defray our radio expense. We have around 260 some odd uh, tape, 266 I believe listed, we'd be glad to send you a list of our cassette tape. These are our Sunday morning uh, services. We have uh, about 200 and 66, I believe, listed. But this is tape number 270. You just write in and say, Preach Edward, send me the tape. If you would like to have a list of our tape, we'll send you a list. And then you can secure the ones you'd like to have by number or by title. My mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia. 30603 is the zip code number. Now, this preacher has a birthday coming up this coming Thursday. If God spares me to see this coming Thursday, I'll pass another milestone. I'll be three score, half a decade, one year, 12 months, and 52 weeks old this coming Thursday. If God spares me to see that day. I was born out here in Madison County in a little country farm home on what they call the old Jack Landers home place. That's just out of Danielsville, little country boy. My parents were farmers. I was born out there in a little country home. I was born at home so I could be with my mother and not with the nurses. Now, seriously, we didn't have a chance to go to the hospital in those days where the good nurse could take care of the baby, so mother had to take care of me. And back in those days, that happened to most people that were born. The old doctor would have to get up about one o'clock in the morning, it real cold or pouring down rain, and get his buggy and his horse and go to deliver the child. Usually it happened maybe at night or when weather was bad. But the good old country doctor always did his job in those days. Now this day and time, the young women are more fortunate. They have the hospitals where they go and give birth to their children. They have the good nurses to take care of them. But I was born where my mother had to take care of me, and I don't fuss about that. And so my mother's in heaven today. She's a great blessing to me while she's on the earth. And so you pray for me that God will let me live a little while longer to finish the job he has for me to do. I don't know how long that'll be when my race will be run. But I certainly don't have as many years ahead of me as I have behind me. I've been preaching the gospel for 45 years, and I hope God will let me. He was five years old when the tidings came of Saul and Jonathan of Jezreel, and his nurse took him up and fled, and it came to pass as she made haste to flee that he fell and became lame, and his name was Mephibosheth. That name Mephibosheth means a shameful thing. I'm going to speak today about the nurse that dropped the little child and he was crippled the rest of his days. Now in 2 Samuel chapter 9, permit me to read a few verses there, page 364 in the original Schofield Reference Bible. I want you to stick with the old King James Version, the original Schofield Reference Bible, especially the King James Version, 1611 edition. 
I was reading the other day where these liberals and infidels and modernists are now going to print a new Bible. They're going to do some changing of the Bible. That's a, a sudden, a, a subtle, cunning attack of the devil to tamper the word of God. You stick with the old book. There's too much of these new translations coming on the scene today. I have no use for them. I stick with the old Bible, and you'll do well to do so. God gave us the old King James Version, 1611 edition, and has used it to save nations, to save multitudes, to send revivals, and save a multitude of people. And you'll do well to use this book as long as you live. When these new modern translations come along, throw them in the trash can. That's where they belong. Stick to the old book of God where you can read the word of God. Now in 2 Samuel chapter 9, verse 1, And David said, Is there yet any that is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziber. And when they had called him unto David, the king said unto him, Art thou Ziber? And he said, Thy servant is he. And the king said, Is there not yet any of the house of Saul, that I might show the kindness of God unto him? And Ziba said unto the king, Jonathan had yet a son which is lame on his feet. Now that's as far as I'm reading. I will be referring to other verses in this chapter. So you keep your Bible open here. Now there was a great conflict between the house of Saul and the house of David. Now you're familiar with that, I'm sure. Saul became very jealous of David. David had a son in the name of Jonathan. And he became a real close friend to David. Saul's son was Jonathan and he became a close friend of David. They loved each other. And of course, the house of Saul had diminished because of sin. And God began to raise up his choice servant, David, to be king in Israel. But David and Jonathan were very close. And there they made a covenant. Uh, Jonathan said to David, he said, David, I know my father is trying to take your life. But one of these days, you're going to be king in Israel. And when you become king in Israel, I want you to remember my household, remember my descendants. And David said, Jonathan, I will remember your household. They made that covenant. You find that also in the scriptures. And when they made that covenant, time moved on. And, and then the Saul passed off the scene and so did Jonathan. And so did Saul's sons. And of course, we find one or two left behind. But David became king in Israel. And when he became king in Israel, he was just thinking one day about his old friend, Jonathan. And then all of a sudden, he happened to remember that covenant he made with Jonathan, that he would uh, spare his household, he wouldn't destroy all of his descendants, that his seed might remain in Israel. And David began to think about it. He said, now I wonder if Jonathan has any descendants on the earth. I need to check up and find out about my old friend because I do not want to destroy all his descendants. I promised him I would not do so. And David began to inquire about it. And then Ziba here, a servant also in the family, told David, said, David, there is a son of, of, of Jonathan. His name is Mephibosheth. He's lame on his feet, been a cripple all of his life. And he lives out here in, a, in the country in another village. And he's yet alive. And I want to deal with this line of thought today because we see the marvelous grace of God here demonstrated in what took place. Now notice Mephibosheth's condition. He was lame by a fall. The Bible said when the word came that uh, King Saul had been killed and his sons had been killed... Then this nurse picked up the son of Jonathan, Mephibosheth, in her arms, and she was running. She was fleeing for their lives. And all of a sudden, she dropped this little five-year-old boy. And when he hit the ground, it crippled him, and he was crippled the rest of his days. He could not walk a step because that nurse had dropped him. And if you notice here, he fell. He hit the ground. He was crippled. By a nurse. He was run in a fall by a nurse. Now we know according to the Bible that the devil crippled the human race. First entering in through Eve and then Adam. 
Eve being deceived and Adam willfully sinned, the devil crippled the entire human race. And spiritually speaking, we've been crippled since that time. And what I mean by that is we cannot walk for God until you get saved. I don't care who you are, how much you sacrifice, how many good deeds you manifest, you cannot walk for God, not one step, until you come to know God. And we have this picture here. This boy had been crippled. He could not walk, uh, literally, and he had no strength. In his legs. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 5 and verse 6. When we were yet without strength. In due time Christ died for the ungodly. There's not a sinner on this earth today. That has strength enough to walk one step for God spiritually speaking. You can walk for yourself. You can walk for mankind. You can walk for your friend. But you can't walk for God. Not the first step can you take. I don't care who you are. You first got to become a child of God by faith in Jesus Christ. And then as a babe in Christ, you begin to take your first steps for God and not until then. Now he lost everything. We lost everything in that fall. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, then we lost everything. All of our strength we had nothing to buy with. Couldn't walk for God. Couldn't live good enough to get to heaven. Something had to be done for us. And for years, the human race has been in that condition. That's why it is today. Lost and without God, can't walk for God. No strength without God, spiritually speaking. Now, I want you to notice here where this crippled man is located. Where he's found. Now, the Bible said he fled. He did not, uh, they did not find him in Jerusalem. When David said, where is Mephibosheth? I, I want to find him. And then, of course, we find that this man here, Zyber, said he's not in Jerusalem. That means he's not in the city of possession of peace. The name Jerusalem means possession of peace. This man is not in peace. He's out in the land of Lodibar. He's not here. That's a picture of every sinner today. He's not in possession of God's peace. He's an enmity with God, not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. And he needs to make peace with his God before he dies and goes to hell. And so he fled and he was in no possession of peace. The Bible said he was in Lodibar. The name Lodibar means a place of no pasture. Now if you had cattle out in a field with no grass, what good would it do the cattle? That eventually starved to death. This man was in Lodibar, a place of no pasture, meaning he had nothing spiritual out there where he was sitting out there in a faraway village in the land of Lodibar. The Bible says in 2 Samuel chapter 9 and verse 4, And the king said unto him, Where is he? Ziba said unto the king, Behold, he's in the house of Micah, the son of Amiel, from Lodibar. That's why you'll find him. And then number three, David the king sought for him. But Phibosheth is in the land of Lodibar in the house of Micah. And he didn't have any idea that on the throne in Jerusalem was a king, one of the greatest kings that ever lived, sitting on his throne thinking about him. One day God thought about you. You didn't realize that, but God was concerned about you, and God did something about that. God sent his son to die for you. And then God sent some preacher to preach to you. And the Holy Spirit used the Word of God and began to deal with you. You didn't know God was doing all of that until it happened. And this crippled man out in the land of Lodibar didn't know King David was interested in him, concerned about him. In verses 1 and 5 it said, And David said, Is there yet any one left the house of Saul? Then King David sent and fetched him. Now the Bible said he fetched him. Now that word fetch there is a strong word in the Bible. It literally means you go get him and bring him here. You get him in my presence. I want him here before me. Now that's a picture of the Holy Spirit reaching out for that sinner and bringing him to God. Now this man had no love for David. The crippled man wanted to stay away from David. Like most sinners want to stay away from God and God's people and God's church. 
And so he was not looking for David, but David was looking for him. You were not looking for God when God got a hold of your heart. God was looking for you. The Bible tells us Jesus said, you did not choose me, I chose you. Now I'm glad about that he had no love for David. There was not one thing David could expect in return from this crippled man. What in the world could David expect from this poor old cripple that had been crippled all the days of his life, now in the land of Lodibar? What good was he to David? What good are we to God? God looked down upon us, saw us sinful, weak, and ungodly without God. And yet the grace of God reaches down and saves us and makes something out of us. You're somebody, if you're saved, well, you realize you're not. You're a child of God. Have God join out with Jesus Christ, according to the Bible. There was not one thing David could expect in return from this man. Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20 he said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if any man open the door, I will come in and sit with him, and he with me. David said, I want you to go and fetch that man here. I want him right here in my presence. I want him here. And of course, we find that Zyber got the, uh, maybe the, uh, uh, some of the troops together and they set out for the land of Lodibar. That word fetch means go get it. My old grandmother used that term. Uh, she'd always say go fetch. Go fetch this and fetch that. It's a good word, strong word. When I was a little boy, we had to bring water from a spring about a quarter of a mile away. And it seemed like every time I visited my grandmother, the water bucket was empty. And she'd say, Virgil, I want you to take this water bucket and go to the spring and fetch me some water. And I want you to get back as quick as you can. So we had running water in those days, but I did the running. I ran to the spring. I got the water that came back. Of course, we had ice water in the wintertime whenever it was below 32 degrees. But it was kind of rough in those days. But we enjoyed it anyway. And I fetched water to my grandmother and placed it on the table. And it seemed like they, every time I visited her, we lived just below her, the water bucket was empty. She was looking for me, oldest grandson, to come and go get a bucket of water. She said, son, go fetch me some water. And I went and fetched that water. Now, that's a good word, the strong word. Old timers still use it. Nothing wrong with it. Be good to you. It means to get it here. It means I, I want it. I'm not going to take no for it. That's I want it right here. Go and get it. Number three, notice Mephibosheth's reaction toward David. Now, David said, go and fetch him. And they went out, and no doubt those soldiers pulled up in the yard. And, and this crippled man said, what are they doing here? And then we find that Micah said, I don't know, I'll find out. He goes out and he said, uh, what can I do for it? They said, we, we are looking for a crippled man, Mephibosheth. Is he here? And I just surmise that Mephibosheth heard that and he tried to hide in the house. But he couldn't hide. A lot of people try to run from God. But you can't get away from God. David tells us, tells us about that. And so he said, I want him. He said, well, he, he's in the house. They went in and they grabbed this boy. And no doubt they put him on this little card and headed back toward Jerusalem. And he was trimming like a leaf. They brought him in. He just knew that the, although he was the grandson of Saul, the son of Jonathan, he was to be put to death. He just knew that. But they brought him in. And when they came in and brought him before King David, King David looked at him and said, Are you Mephibosheth? Yes, sir. And David called him by name, the poor old crippled fellow sitting there trembling like a leaf. He just knew David was going to put him to death. The Bible said in verses 6 through 8, Now when Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, son of Saul, was come unto David, he fell on his face, notice what he did, and did reverence. And David said, Mephibosheth, called him by name. See, uh, God knows your name too. He knows your house number. He knows your phone number. And David said unto him, Fear not, for I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake. And we restore thee all the land of Saul thy father, and thou shalt eat bread at my table continually. And he bowed himself and said, What is thy servant that, I should look upon, that you should look upon a dead dog as I am? David said, Listen, Mephibosheth, for your father Jonathan's sake, one of the best friends I ever had. I made a covenant with him that I would not destroy his descendants. And I'm going to bring you in here. I will give you a portion of land. 
I'm going to give you what your father lost. I'm going to restore that back to you. And you're going to sit here in the kingdom, here in my palace. And I want you to sit at my table and eat my food and be among my servants. Mephibosheth said, me, sir, fell down on his face in reverence, said, a dead dog like me come to king's palace, a place where other dignitaries would like to just peep in, where they'd like to get a glimpse through the window. And here I am on the inside and sitting at the king's table and treated like a king's son, sir, I don't deserve that. David said, nevertheless, I'm going to do this for your father's sake. I'm going to do this for my good friend, Jonathan's sake. You're sitting right here today. Now, you listen to me. Look, I'm here to preach you. Listen to me. You're sitting right here today for Jesus' sake. The reason you're not in hell, the reason you're saved, and in the house of God today, you're here for Jesus' sake. The Bible tells us so. In Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32, the Bible says, Be ye kind one to another, tender heart, forgiving one another, even as God... For Christ's sake hath forgiven you. You have been forgiven and saved for Jesus' sake. That's why you're saved today. You didn't deserve it. I should have been in hell a long time ago. You should have been there. We don't deserve anything. But for Jesus' sake, God saved us and we're sitting here saved. Now he fell on his face. He humbled himself. David called him by name and then he feared. The Bible says he was trembling. So did the Philippian jailer in Acts 16 came running and fell down before Paul in silence and said, what must I do to be saved? And then he called himself a dead dog. The Gentiles were called dogs in those days, the days of Christ. But I'm glad that the Bible said that one of this woman said to Jesus, the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the table. I'm glad I got some of the crumbs today. Hallelujah. That fell from the table. Although I was a Gentile dog, but God saved me. And he called him in his father's house. He called his father's house dead men. In 2 Samuel chapter 19, verses 28 through 30, Mephibosheth said, my father's house is a house of dead men. That's exactly what the human race is today and what my household had been and yours. There have been dead men and women, dead spiritually. And people without God today are still dead spiritually without God. Their alive man would. They're alive worldward, but they're dead Godward, just as dead spirits to speak in the sight of God as this pulpit stands. He said they're dead men, dead dogs without God. Now notice another thought and notice why David sought after this man. In verses 1 and 7, that I might show him kindness for Jonathan's sake, I will surely show thee kindness for Jonathan thy father's sake. David said, I want that crippled man in my palace. Not because he deserves it. I want him here because his old daddy is one of the best friends I ever had. And I want to do it to him. I want to help him. I want to bring him in here for his old daddy's sake. I promise I wouldn't destroy his descendants. One day there's a man walking down the street. A little boy came along and said, Mister, would you give me uh, 25 cents? The man said, Boy, get away from here. I don't have time to fool with you. But he noticed something about that boy that reminded him of somebody. He said, son, said, uh, whose boy are you? He told him. He said, wait a minute. You don't, you don't get 25 cents. You get 50 cents. Said, your old daddy did me a favor one time. One of the best friends I ever had, son. And you get 50 cents because I think that much of your daddy. He gave that boy 50 cents for his daddy's sake. Don't you ever forget that you're in the family of God, that you're saved today, that you're Christian today for Jesus' sake. You didn't deserve it, neither did I. We are saved for Jesus' sake. Now notice what was done for him. The Bible said he was brought to the king's palace where many desired only just to look in. He was brought in, his life was spared. Now David intended to kill all the sinners of Saul, get rid of them. But his life was spared. He was brought into the king's palace and received peace for fear. He was trembling like a leaf when he came in. But he received some peace for fear. That's exactly what every sinner gets. When the Philippian jailer got saved, he was full of fear. But he got the peace of God in his heart. And that took care of that fear. 
If you're out there in the radio listen orders today and you're afraid, you're trembling, you don't know what the future holds, you don't know which way to turn, turn to Jesus. God will take that fear away from you and give you the peace of God in your heart. Where sin abound, grace does much more abound. And you must remember that. He was placed in an honored position. Verse 11, he shall eat at my table as one of the king's sons. Many years ago, there's a man, businessman, out on a mission. He came in. He had three little girls. The baby girl was a little crippled girl. Her hand was deformed. Her leg was deformed. She could hardly walk. She walked bent over sideways. Her mouth was all drawn. And she was deformed when she was born. Daddy came home one day, and the oldest little girl fixed up a beautiful little flower bouquet and fixed it up real nice and run to meet Daddy. And gave it to him. The second girl did likewise. She picked some beautiful flowers. And there she fixed it up real beautiful. And ran and met daddy. And gave it to daddy. The little crippled one came dragging one foot. All bent over, all twisted up. And all she had in her hand was a little dandelion. She had picked that little old flower. She tried to get some together because of her deformity she couldn't. And all she had was that little dandelion, this kind of bruise that she had picked. And, but she was hopping and trying to get to Daddy. Daddy saw her coming, and he reached out and took the little thing in his arm and took that little bruised flower, and he kissed her real good. He said, Honey, I appreciate your little flower just as much as I did your sister's little flowers, even more because of uh, your, the condition you're in. I love you, darling. And I want you to know, and I appreciate this little flower. Now, you can't bring anything much to God but yourself. And I don't care what kind of shape you're in. You may be a drunkard out there, listen to me. You may be a, a cursor, a gambler. You may be a very wicked person. There's nothing you can bring to God but yourself. You come just like you are, and God will take you like you are. Now, that's the way they brought Mephibosheth in, crippled. Full of fear, trembling, afraid, and brought him in, and he became one of David's servants, or like a son in his home. The Bible says in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 1, Behold what man of love the Father has bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. See, God bestowed his love upon us, we might be, be called the sons of God. Now here we find Mephibosheth eating at the father's at the king's table. He sat there with those servants. And he had lame feet, but glory to God, he put those feet under that table, and David wasn't looking at those feet. They were hid under the table. Now I don't care what your past life may have been. When you come to God, they go under the table as it were, and God don't see them. God doesn't hold your past life against you. When you get saved, God blots out all your past sins and starts you anew on the road to heaven. He was lame, but the feet were under the table. And the Bible said he was to dwell there the rest of his days. Now David didn't say, now listen, Mephibosheth, I'm going to let you stay here for a week, a month, or a year. I'll let you stay here until I get ready to send you out from you. No, no. David said to his servants, I want you to look after this man. I want you to care for him. I want him to put his feet under my table. I want him to be among my servants and my sons. And I want him to stay here the rest of his days. The rest of his days. When God saved you, he saved you forever. When God saved you, he saved you for the rest of your days. A lot of people think salvation like a man riding a bicycle. When you stop pedaling, you fall off. No, no, you don't save yourself. God saves you by his marvelous grace. God keeps you by his wonderful power. And when God saves you, he saves you for eternity. He saves you for the rest of your days. And you ought to appreciate that. David said, Mephibosheth, don't you worry, son. You have a home here as long as you live. Why? I love your old daddy, that's why. And I'm bringing you in here for your daddy's sake. God the Father said, I've saved you for Jesus' sake. And he said, you forgive one another as I have forgiven you for Christ's sake, saith the Bible. And so we're saved for Jesus' sake. 
Now this man, Mephibosheth, loved David with all of his heart. He just fell in love with him. He didn't love David before David brought him in. And you didn't love God before God saved you either. This man was afraid of David. And you were afraid of God before God saved you. But now he become your loving father. And he brought you in. And this man loved David and he owned the person of David. When Absalom tried to take David's throne and David was coming back in, Mephibosheth went out to meet him. The Bible said um, that he went out to meet him in 2 Samuel chapter 19 verse 24. And Mephibosheth the son of Saul came to meet the king and neither dressed his feet nor trimmed his beard nor washed his clothes from the day the king departed until the day he came again in peace. Whenever David had to leave Jerusalem because of Absalom, his son in rebellion, insurrection against him, they had to leave. But when David was coming back in, then of course Mephibosheth hadn't changed his clothes, hadn't shaved. He just couldn't be happy, couldn't be satisfied with his king hiding away in a cave. But when he heard that King David was coming back, he went out to meet him. And my, and, and my, 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 my sire here, other, uh, the uh, servant here that I mentioned in the beginning, he had lied on David. Let me get that uh, name straight here. I want to be sure and give it to you like it is. Ziba. Ziba is the name I'm trying to remember. Slipped my mind there shortly. But anyway, Ziba had lied on Mephibosheth and said that Mephibosheth was just waiting to receive everything that's supposed to have been his father's. And he lied on, uh, Meph on Mephibosheth. But King David... I said, all right, um, Ziber, I want you to take the land. And because uh, Ziber said Mephibosheth is back in Jerusalem, just waiting to take over in David's place. But when Mephibosheth came on the scene, there he, David found out that Ziba had lied on him. And David said, all right, let him take half the land. You take the other half. You know what Mephibosheth said? He said, no, sir, King David. He said, I'm not concerned about the land. He said, I'm just so glad my king has come back. I want to be in his presence. I want to be near him. I want the king back in the past. I want to be with the king. Now, when Jesus saves you, you're not too much concerned about this world anymore. You want to be with Jesus. You want to be close to him. You want fellowship with him. You love him, and, and he delights that he can commune with you and be close with you. And God wants you close to him. God wants your feet under his table. That's why you're here this morning. You're sitting your feet under God's table. I'm feeding you from the table of God. And God likes that. And that pleases the Lord. If you're not saved, you ought to get saved. See what David did for Mephibosheth? That's exactly what God will do for you. And you need to let God do it if you're not saved. Let's stand to our feet. You've listened well. Our Father... I pray in Jesus' name that you'll take the message and use it. Thank you, God, for your marvelous grace, how that you reached down and lifted us out and out of the miry clay of sin and placed our feet on the solid rock, Christ Jesus. Because of Christ's sake, you did it, Father. We're so glad you did. Speak to hearts here today. Speak to hearts out in the radio listening audience. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I wonder, Debbie, come right on, honey, and play uh, stanza. So while we're waiting, if there's anybody here today that'd like to get saved, or you'd like to come back to God, or you'd like to join the church, while she's playing, would you walk down this aisle? Anyone would like to get saved, come back to God, or join this church, and we receive members, would you come while we wait? You know whether or not God has spoken to you. You know it. I can only give you the word and tell you the way home. If you don't go home, it will be my fault. When I say home, I mean to God's house, God's family. speaking for any reason you think you should come forward